You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. All right, we're here on the Silicon Valley Podcast with our guest Elliot this week. And well, I listened to an episode that uh, David C. Barnett, who's one of my favorite podcasters, he's got an amazing YouTube channel, a lot of great information. Elliot was on his show a little while and I heard that episode. I went, oh my gosh, I got to get this guy on my, my podcast because well, he's an expert in quality of earnings, a topic that to be honest, most people here in Silicon Valley, I don't think they know until they're in the due diligence part of when they're selling a company and, or raising capital. And then they're just going, what is that? Why do I need that? What it is? So I wanted to bring an expert onto the show. So with that, Elliot, can you give our audience a little bit of background of your career up until this point before we dive into the questions? Yeah, um, I'll go through the highlights. So I'm a reformed mechanical engineer uh, like Sean. I uh, did strategy consulting at Accenture for a bit. I went to Harvard for business school. I worked in private equity um, coming out, both sort of formally um, funded sort of institutional capital and then worked for some family offices that did deals. And then I realized pretty quickly that um, owning equity yourself was way better than working for others who represented capital stacks who owned equity. And so I, 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 convinced a mentor to partner with me and we did independent sponsor deals. So call it two to $5 million in EBITDA. You get the deal under letter of intent and then you find the capital to close it during due diligence, leveraging your relationships, of course, but sometimes the deal dictates the capital. And then I was a self-funded searcher uh, when my partner retired. And what I realized in all those instances is the diligence solutions I found for smaller deals weren't that great, Sean. They were pretty terrible, actually. And I saw a lot of new folks coming into the marketplace from the Cody Sanchez's, the Roland Frazier's, all these folks that are advocating for, you know, the Walker Diver Bottom bills. They're advocating for people to, instead of start companies, go buy them. And these folks don't know deals, haven't been investment bankers, haven't been in capital markets. And, and I said they were going to have a real hard time competing and so I started Guardian to sort of be the solution to A, the problems I had finding good diligence, but B, the problems I knew would happen as these new folks came into the market. I'm surprised you said some of those names. I've watched some of those videos because I'll have conversations with entrepreneurs saying, hey, I'm going to sell my business or I'm looking to acquire a business. I just watched one of those YouTube stars and they'll send me a link to a video. I'll just shake my head and go, wait, that's not realistic. That's not Wait, they skipped a part there. They skipped many parts there, actually. And it's, you just shake your head, but you know they're they're influencers right now. They're they're, they're I protect a lot those, of people. I protect those sheep, Sean. So they a lot of steps are skipped, and I could spend time lamenting on how egregious some of these statements that are made are. But the, the challenge becomes there's there's some truth in the in the fray. Um, and I think it's a net positive, even though I cringe, I can't watch them either, if I'm completely honest. And I think I love entrepreneurship. I, I like it as an alternative for folks who want the autonomy and are willing to bet on themselves. But sort of, I think where the buck stops is really in, in my funnel and my services, because let's be completely honest. For most first time buyers, if I start talking about accrual basis, cash basis, working capital, EBITDA versus cash flow. And if I spent 30 days, 10 hours a day teaching them still right over their head. So these folks have the gumption to buy companies, but how do they get comfortable if the deals are any good? And then don't even like load in how crazy some of the brokers and, and crap that can get tried when they know that the person on the other side is naive. So I, I protect people from that craziness. Yeah, you're the, the Q of E Superman, I guess. So. You know what? This week I felt like it. Um, I, it was so bad. I had to write a list of war stories uh, to, to capture some of the craziness that's going on. I mean, later on in the episode, definitely have to hear a story or two. But before even that, mention quality of earnings. What is that? What should someone be thinking when they hear that? So I'm going to make it real simple. Um, public companies get audited every year. They have an internal company that does their financials. But before you can invest in Coca-Cola or Google, 
a third party that has no incentive outside of to catch everything the first company missed and be smarter and wiser audits their financials. Well, when you're buying a $10 million manufacturing company outside of Sacramento, you can't afford an audit. So what you get is an audit like product called a quality of earnings that essentially shows you what the normalized cash flow of the business, the normalized EBITDA of the business is so that you can make a decision. So Sean wants to buy a company. Sean doesn't, um, is not a CPA. Sean gets a bunch of wonky Excel financials or some crap from QuickBooks that's all kinds of messed up. Taxes look totally different. And somebody needs to come in and say, hey, Sean, like taxes said this thing, financial said this thing, bank statement said this thing. Here's the real cash flow. You can make an investment decision off of this. So the quality of earnings is a 10 to 30 page report that um, takes uh, financials of varying quality and puts them into a, a report you know, of the quality that a bank can look at, an equity investor, somebody can make a decision based off of. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. So, I mean, when would you recommend someone, someone get in this? And actually, if you could dive a little bit deeper on maybe the components of what goes into a quality of earnings and, and kind of what's the difference between a quality of earnings and while on your website, you also have quality of earnings light. Sure. So, when you start sending letters of intent to, to sort of really get serious about buying a company, you should be thinking about who's going to do your quality of earnings because they come in different flavors and you're going to want to know what flavor you, you, you want because if the first seller signs your letter of intent, you're in diligence, you're on the time clock, 60 days, oftentimes, you don't want to be looking for people at that point. When you really need to lock in is the week you send that letter of intent, the fourth or fifth one that you really think is going to get signed, you need to be locking in with their provider to make sure they have capacity, that they're comfortable doing your deal, all those kind of things. So you're not um, high and dry. And then if I talk about the quality of earnings versus the quality of earnings, like for us, I fundamentally believe the analysis that needs to be done on small deals is consistent. It, it, when you start pulling scope out of um, a pretty kind of specific scope. Like if you pull the scope out of an audit, it's just some analysis. It's not like a half audit. So the way that we do it is quality of earnings light is the full scope of work, but presents it in an Excel workbook. So for those who understand Excel can explain Excel to a banker, to an equity investor. If you're comfortable in Excel, that may be enough. For those who might not be, um, the quality running standard is that same Excel sheet with now a 30 page PDF that even if you don't really fully understand it, you can send it to a bank and they know what they're looking at. You can send it to your rich uncle and they know what you're looking at. Um, so it makes it easier to consume. That's the way we look at it. Some people look at it differently, but I, I fundamentally believe if you start taking scope out of a QOE, you start getting garbage. You'd mentioned reconciling the taxes, the uh, financial, uh, putting that together. I mean, is that what a quality of earnings is or could you elaborate a little bit more what they'll find or what they'll see in a quality of earnings? So let me talk about it in the context of a single company. I think it'll be easier that way. So the typical private business owner underspends on accounting. If you don't have VC money in your business, you start a service company, you, you, you underspend on bookkeeping for a long time. So you have wonky financials. You pay somebody 1,500, 3,000 bucks to do your taxes. You call, them your, you call them your CPA, but they really are your tax person. <laughs> They're your H&R block. Um, you don't want to over-report profits to your 30% business partner of the government. So those always look wonky too. And then when it comes time to sell, you want to go talk to a broker or a banker who's going to take, you know, your marginal profit that was shown on the tax returns, adjust, 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 and adjusted EBITDA is just this huge mountain of, 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 of adjusted cash flow. Okay. So let me get back to brass tax. So your financials are wonky because you underspent on them. Your cousin did them, you know, your friend from high school, you know, whoever did them. Okay. Um, they're just 
volatile. They're not accurate. They're not according to Gap. Guys like Sean and I that are used to seeing financials all the time will look at your stuff and laugh. And banks will not be able to interpret it. And they're not going to ask you how to figure it out. They're going to stop. Then your taxes, say you did a million dollars in profit. You're probably not telling the government that. So you're going to spend, you're going to donate, you're going to whoop de whoop whoop whoop. And so you're going to have something like less than a million bucks. So, um, and then you go get this banker, you had a million dollars of profit. They're going to adjust, adjust, adjust. And that's going to be a whole lot more than a million bucks. So as a buyer, I see this confidential information memorandum that says this company is doing 1.8, 1.8, and I promise you it's going to do $2.2 million in EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA next year. That's one data point. Then I have their internal financials that say something like a million dollars in profit, but they're very volatile and they don't look correct, and I couldn't send them to a bank. Then I look at their taxes. Their taxes say they did $200,000 of, of EBITDA. And so it's somewhere in between 1.8 and 200000 So now you understand where I live. So I live in the land of Elliot. You need to take the taxes that show basically nothing, the financials that may show something reasonable, but very volatile and wonky. And then the sim that looks beautiful, but you know, has some icing on that cake and reconcile those things to the truth. Well, Elliot, what the heck is the truth? In small business financials, the truth is difficult. And I'll get into that in a second, but it's knowable. Um, And so you just have to get to the bottom. Now, is there anything that can uh, affect these quality of earnings? Like how would revenue recognition impact quality of earnings? Yeah. Um, So I'm going to go nerd for a minute. Uh, Forgive me those who who, who aren't revenue recognition buffs, but I'll talk about revenue recognition. So Sean, what I have to do a lot of times is explain some of this stuff to regular folks because 90% of my clients are first time buyers. 90% aren't financial. So revenue recognition is I have a landscaping company. Um, I'm Sean calls me and says, Hey, I want my lawn done. He calls me on the 1st of January. Uh, I say, Hey man, I can come out on the 30th of January, but I send him an invoice on the 15th of January. I come out on the 30th. He doesn't pay me until February 15th. And, um, what revenue recognition is at which one of those points, January 1, January 15th, February 1, February 15th, when does that revenue get recognized? And so can revenue recognition have an impact? Absolutely, because most owners are going to be looking to maximize the EBITDA. And so as a result, the revenue in the last full calendar year. So they're gonna be trying to pull things into 2022 from 2021, They're going to be trying to pull things from 2023 into 2022. And so a lot of what you have to do is understand what is the standard way revenue is recognized and make sure it's applied consistently throughout because you wouldn't want someone to use. So there's two main ways of uh, recognizing revenue, cash and accrual. I won't get into that. But what people oftentimes do, particularly at the lower end of the market, is they mix up cash. They don't mix up. They use cash where it's convenient and they use accrual where it's convenient. And so you have this highest project of the two and that's cheating. With that, where do you see most of, I'm not sure if you've dealt with a lot of startups, but you know, here in Silicon Valley, I, I think a lot of people, I'm pretty sure to be honest, have no idea about the financials. Just as mentioned, you know, give it to a person at the end of the year and go, here you go. Where do you see them making the bulk of their mistakes? So I had a client this year that had a startup. He sold a product online. Um, And over time he had, you know, hundreds of products. And now the company's doing 10, 15 million. So it's not software, but I think your listeners that are startup folks will understand this. So when he was doing $100,000, he had basic, uh infrastructure when he was at you know almost a million dollars of revenue he had more stuff that he had bolted on by the time he gets to 15 million in revenue he's got four or five bolts on for inventory four or five crms four or five platforms he's selling on all this kind of stuff right and he called me and he's like hey man you do quality of earnings but 
I don't know if somebody's stealing from me and all these different products that I have in my stack. I don't know if I'm overpaying or underpaying for taxes because everybody points the finger at the other one when this is all over. And I'm really having a hard time getting to an estimate of my cash flow because some of these systems have variability that impact my cash all the way. And so your startup may be four or five CRMs and a bunch of different bookkeepers. You have all this stuff. So um, where does the QOE potentially help you? So what, what that client told me essentially is instead of paying a bookkeeper for six months to straighten all this stuff out, I can pay you a fixed fee of like 30 grand, 40 grand to give me the last three years of what the financial should look like. So that when I'm talking to my tax person, when I'm thinking about how much cash flow I'm going to make, when I'm thinking about what these financials should look like, I know. And so that's where I think a startup owner could think about it and say, hey, look, if you get to a place where your financials are unruly, you're going to have to spend a lot of time with bookkeepers to straighten them out. It may be quicker for you to get a quality of earnings to give you the last three years um, while you may take your three to six months to uh, have a bookkeeper straighten it out. So how long do I take? I take four to five weeks. So you'll know, you know, in a month and a week um, what you need to know. Or here's the other one. Sean, I have a startup um, and I've got it to five, 10 million and I want to take some cash off the table. So I'm like, hey, Sean, I don't want to go raise a venture round, but like you like investing in startups. I want you to buy 10% of my equity. And you're going to ask me what's 10% of my equity worth. And if it's not a simple revenue multiple that gets the valuation, if it's a cash flow business, then you may need to do a quality of earnings to understand what the value that Sean will put on my business to then buy 10% of. Well, that's interesting. So you can use a quality of earnings to kind of figure out everything that's happened in the last few years. You can use a quality of earnings uh, to give information to an investor to raise capital and quality of earnings for a merger acquisition. Are there any other use cases for quality of earnings? Um, if you think somebody's stealing from you, which can happen, right? Um, um, if you think that you're going to be selling in a year or two, which is M and A, but I think a lot of folks wait until what I call like 1159. It's like, you know, the 10th venture capitalist or the, the, the 10th rich dude called and wants to buy it. And you're going to have a roadshow meeting on Monday and it's Friday. And you're like, Hey man, I want to get a quality of earnings. Can you do it over the weekend? Um, a year before it'd be wise. To, to have that. Um, here's why as an entrepreneur, forget my hat selling QOEs. I want all of my entrepreneurs to get rich. When you're not financial and you have financial conversation with financial masterminds, they know it and they discredit what you created because you don't know what the cash flow is, which you may know, but you don't speak their language. They're already judging you. And if they really get you in a bind, they can take advantage of you and pay you less. Don't be in that position. Get ahead of that. If you don't speak the language, Get your financials in the language so that when you're having these conversations, you're not off put. Sean and I are engineers, so we have a special way of thinking about numbers. We had to relearn those to be finance guys. Our engineer buddies get taken advantage of because sometimes they can't do net present value, which is similar to the startup person that knows the operation, but maybe not the cash flow or the income statement and balance sheet. Don't be a dummy. I think that's going to be the little TikTok clip from, uh, for this episode. Send that to me. That'll probably do well on my Twitter too. So, so what are some of the the key things that could impact quality of earnings? I mean, we talked revenue recognition, but there's got to be a ton of things that, oh, that can yeah. impact it. Consistency of revenue and profit. So, you see these like a million, a million, five million. Well, that's not nearly as good as a million three five. So, the consistency of profits. Um, the industry, right? So software is going to get a way higher multiple than, um, you know, manufacturing. And so that's a piece of the quality range because of how it's used. The messiness of your financials. So if I go from the cleanest set of financials I've seen this year to the craziest, almost nobody was going to invest in the craziest, no matter what I did. There just wasn't any factual stuff to go back to that people would believe. 
Whereas the cleanest set of financials, even if the business stunt, somebody could get to evaluation because they could understand the financials. And so how messy your financials come into play. Um, how strong is the management team? Now, I'm not an investment banker, so I'm not doing SIMS. But part of what we talk about is who's going to be in the deal post-close, who's not, and what's sort of the adjusted uh, cost basis. And if you don't have a management team that's sticking around, not only um, is there more volatility around who's going to run it, but people are going to value their business differently. Um, what are some other things that really affect QOE? Um, so you're talking to Silicon Valley, so most companies are low CapEx, right? But let's think about a manufacturing company that, or a trucking company that may be high CapEx. You may be very used to getting to EBITDA and that being the end of the report. So on page 30 at the end, EBITDA, good job. Well, what investors really want to know is cash flow. And so for cash flow, you may have to do something like EBITDA minus CapEx or EBITDA minus something else. And so as the business becomes more capital intensive, the the end result of what your QOE needs to deliver has to adjust for the fact that really the reason we use EBITDA is because it's a proxy for cash flow. It's close. When EBITDA is not a proxy for cash flow, you need to do other adjustments because my job as a QOE provider is to tell my client what the cash flow of the business is. If EBITDA is close enough, I can stop there. If it's not, I need to keep going. How do one-time events impact quality of earnings? So I'll give a for instance. Recently, there were a lot of PPP loans and other government assistance that came out during COVID. And a lot of owners tried to push that through as revenue and normal profits. I don't think those PPP loans are coming back, Sean. So you have to adjust that stuff out. Or um, let's say I am a, a landscaping business and I do residential stuff and all of a sudden because my cousin is involved with the city, I get a contract for a year to go do landscaping at some huge stadium. But it only takes half a year and it's never going to happen again. So a lot of what happens is you have to adjust out these one-time things to focus on the consistent operation of the business, right? Um, and so one-time events, they kind of cut both ways. Like, does somebody like seeing more cash flow? Sure. But when that extra cash flow has to be adjusted out because it's so obviously not normal, it, it actually can be a deterrent rather than a, a selling point. That's interesting. Cause I mean, if you were to take that out, we could lower the EBITDA, it could lower a lot of things. And well, I guess the question there then is how do quality of earnings affect the valuation of a company? Most people, most sophisticated investors and even a lot of lenders won't feel that the valuation is finalized until they get their quality of earnings back. But Elliot, I sent the letter of intent in three months ago. Yeah, that's cute, directional, hopefully close, but the reason the reason quality of earnings are done because they're 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 significant projects is because when they stink deals die. So um, what ends up happening is most buyers are saying, "Hey, look, I'm willing to pay a six, a seven multiple for a business of this size in this industry." So I believe there's a million dollars of EBITDA here, so I'm going to multiply it times six for a six million dollar valuation. All right, but what I really told you is I'm willing to pay six times EBITDA. So if my quality of earnings comes back and it's 800,000, then I'm going to reduce my price more than likely. If it comes back and it's higher than a million, I'm just going to smile and act like nothing happened. Uh, and, 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 and thank God that I paid for this analysis. But even the, the banks oftentimes when they get confused by the financials from the company, which is the first thing they'll look at, they'll look at the quality of earnings and say, hey, look, you know, the, the EBITDA here is lower than what we were told. We don't think this business is worth over four times EBITDA. We're not going to lend three and a half, right? And so because valuation is a function of EBITDA and QOE is a tool to find 
third party believable EBITDA, it has a huge effect on valuation. It was mentioned at the very beginning a little bit, but just for, I can already picture the audience while listening thinking, you know, what's the difference between quality of earnings and an audit? I mean, is there a difference? Huge difference. So, and this is one I don't get asked much, so I'm thinking of how to say it kind of specifically. So an audit is typically only done on an annual basis because so many businesses have um, year-end adjusting entries that need to be considered. So not that you can't, but most times audits for 2022. So we're in June of 2023, your audit would be for 2022. So one limitation of an audit is that it's typically only through the last calendar year. So therefore you have these sub periods that can be important. Second off, an audit's purpose is to use all of the procedures that help identify and, and uncover financial irregularities to figure out what the true cash flow, EBITDA, income statement, um, balance sheet of a business are. So they're, they're testing invoices, they're testing vendors, they're testing W-2s, they're testing payroll. So it might take three months for an audit to be done. Um, audits are typically also done in a confirmation sort of orientation. So Johnny's Pizza closed the books December 31st. Um, they ordered an audit January 15th. They get it April 15th. Most people don't expect there to be any huge differences between the end of year financials and the audit. Um, Whereas a quality of earnings is a typically through the last closed month. So like we're doing quality of earnings that are going through April, 2023 and it's June 9th, 2023 when I'm recording this. Also, we are less concerned with each and every bit of the financials being presented correctly than we are about presenting a view of cash flow because our clients are buying businesses based on multiples of cash flow. And so they need to know that. So what does that mean for my analysis being different than an audit? What it means is if contracts aren't a huge piece of this business, I may not test contracts because I'm really dialed in on asset value. Or um, if payroll would normally be something that I would test in the audit, but this business is all about recurring revenue on a software business and customer churn, I'm going to spend way more time on that than payroll. So we're, we're kind of tasked with being laser focused on what are the main levers that drive cash flow. And then our timeline is different. We're not talking two to three months. We're talking two to four weeks, depending on how you run your process. So, and then an audit's going to be, you know, 10 pages of financials and 20 pages of uh, qualitative information. Ours is more visual from the beginning. So it's 30 slides, essentially. There's a lot of financials in them, but the good ones have description of what you're looking at on each thing. So it's more, it's more palatable for a more novice investor. I think an audit's harder to read. I mean, you just mentioned that for investors. How would someone use the quality of earnings to communicate with investors or stakeholders? So I got to keep it real. Nobody believes your numbers when you send them. Nobody. Sean doesn't. I don't. The investors don't. Your mama doesn't. Your daddy doesn't. Nobody. Nobody believes it. I don't care what you say. And they might believe it on the boat on the weekend or at the bar. But when you're saying, hey, I want you to invest in my private company equity, some of the most risky stuff, I, I don't believe you anymore. So how does a quality of earnings uh, come into play? It's, it's how you communicate with investors in a way where they can believe it. So they know a company like mine is 100% based on how objective we are around presenting cash flow and EBITDA correctly. That's it. I can make the report look cute. I can do great customer service. I can do podcasts like this for Sean. But what do people hold me accountable for? How good is he at presenting cash flow? The other thing that comes up is 
when Sean's raising capital for Sean's business, Sean wants maximum dollars. So he's going to present everything in a positive light. Sean, the investment banker, as he works for other people, is tasked with maximizing values. He's going to show things in the best light, being a good steward to his client. I don't. I don't put stuff in my report that I haven't checked. I don't put lofty stories about what's going to happen next year and could potentially be the next big thing that this company's tied into. I don't even make assumptions around downside stuff that might not be that important. My reports are objective so that when somebody gets a Guardian and Elliot Holland quality of earnings, it's the revenue was, the costs were, they went up like this, they were affected by this, they did this. This is a little bit off from how you should expect it. So what you do is now all of a sudden, let's say there's not an investment banker in there. Because if there is, there's some similarities between what we do. And maybe we touch on that next. Um, but let's just say you're trying to have somebody come buy 25% of your equity. You're going to send them your financials and they're going to say, yeah, uh, how do I know these are real? Oh man, I get my CPA to do my taxes. You mean that $1,500 a year, dude? Hey buddy, go get a quality of earnings so I can look at it in the language I'm used to, to reading from a person who's objective so that we can really have this conversation, right? So people don't really take a lot of entrepreneurs seriously without a quality of earnings or some sort of third party, um, like unbiased point of view. I liked in your story how on both sides of the table, the character's name was Sean. That was my favorite part of it. Hey, I know where I'm at, Sean. You know, I, I figured you'd like that name. So, so how can you use a quality of earnings to make business decisions strategically? So I would argue if you don't know how much cash you're producing in a predictable way, I don't know how you can be strategic. Now, a lot of people play that game. But I'll tell you, when you get above your head in that game, you run out of cash and you are out of business. So how do you use the quality of earnings to be objective? I almost think the question should be, how do you use accurate, consistent financials prepared appropriately to make strategic decisions? And, and if you haven't paid your bookkeeping staff to do that, the quality of earnings is the backstop, right? You do that because... Um, Let's say Sean and I are business partners and we're trying to figure out, hey, um, we're trying to triple our revenue and, and, and quadruple our profits for next year. And we have this business plan of these five to six things we're going to do. And they're going to all have a cost associated with them. And we're in our strategic planning meeting. And um, we don't know how much cash our business creates. It's really lumpy and, and variable. And some months we make money, some months we don't. In absence of clean financials, a quality of earnings is a good way to get them. We're not going to know if we're going to have enough cash to do all six of those projects. We're not going to know if we're going to run out of cash three months into it and be more stuck trying to stay out of bankruptcy than building the business. We don't know if um, a 30% rise in revenue will have a 40, a 50, a 60% impact on bottom line. So you're like shooting in the dark. You just Honestly, making stuff up, if you don't have clean financials, maybe you have a lens on what we call like a um, incremental income statement or incremental project. Maybe you can do like a back of the envelope there. But I'll tell you, when I get into situations where the owners of companies don't understand how certain things drive revenue and profit and cash flow, they just hope they just watch their bank account and hope it goes up. When it goes down, they don't know what happened a lot of time. And that, that's crazy to to think some of these companies, yeah, they really don't know their numbers, they don't know their metrics, they don't. So so I mean, most of the audience here, most of them are entrepreneurs, investors in startups here in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between the quality of earnings with private companies versus maybe a public one, or is there a difference? There is. So I'm going to take my guardian hat off and just be some dude at some class and some college. Right. So when you get a quality of earnings for, um, 
uh, I don't know, Calendly, I'm in Atlanta. So like Calendly is a big company here. Um, uh, I don't think they're public though, so that's a bad example. Um, call it Coca-Cola, call it, uh, they wanna buy some chip manufacturer somewhere that's public, right? Um, you're gonna get one of the big four more than likely. You're gonna get Deloitte, BWC, Ernst & Young, uh, and then these guys to to come in and 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 part of it is just their processes are more detailed. Part of it is their talent is better, but part of it is nobody asked if the Deloitte quality of earnings was right, right? And when you're dealing with numbers that big and investors that dispersed, you don't have time to to muck around. Now, what ends up happening is sometimes the public company that you're doing a quality of earnings on isn't big enough to get the A team in some of those places, but they need the brand name on that quality of earnings. So they're gonna anchor on the brand name rather than the A team. I think any entrepreneur can sort of understand, you know, are you big enough to get the A team where you're going or are you getting the D team, but you still need the brand? Everybody who's been in business knows that. Private company quality of earnings, most people care less about the brand. Now, when you start getting into 10 million, 20 million and above valuations, people start caring more. When you start talking about valuations under 20 million bucks, they're more concerned, like, does this group that did the quality of earnings know how to think about the cash flow of this business? Are they actually good at it? Do they do these all the time? Can I look at the management team and say, you know what, that person looks like a person who Who's going to do solid work a lot of this stuff isn't brain science it's just meticulous and so if, if it doesn't look like elliot's done you know 30 hvac deals in his, in his history then somebody who's assessing the guardian quality runs on hvac business might say uh, i don't know you know what i mean and so they're the big ones are meant to put everybody at ease because of the big brand name the private company ones are meant to put people at ease because the provider knows that part. So you'll see quality of earnings providers that are good in certain size ranges, certain industries, certain locations, um, and all those things play into how we compete. So you've done this for a, a number of years. You've gotten to work with countless companies. What are some red flags that when you're going through, you go, oh my gosh, that, that just stand out to you? Um, recently two sets of books has been, um, like just happening way more than it, than it should. Almost as if somebody a year ago said, I want to sell. And instead of like correcting the stuff that's been around for 10 years, I want to just start a whole new set. And then these will be clean and that'll be good for the buyer and red flag. Um, a lot of my clients are younger, Sean. And so the business brokers, the bankers, and the, 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 the owners, the sellers can be 20, 30 years older than my clients. So a lot of times I'll get caught into a deal and the broker wants to talk to me right away. There's no reason the broker needs to talk to me. I just need the 40 things in my due diligence list in about four weeks. When they want to have an hour long conversation to tell me, oh, this company is too small for quality of earnings, man. This guy, he's not all financially sophisticated, man. You know, he's just, he's so honest, man. He's a deacon in his church, man. He's got five kids. He adopted two more. Like, you know, this is, this is the salt of earth, dude. Red flag. Um, what's another one? When there's so many people involved in how the financials are prepared that nobody holds the bag. You know, we talk about like one throat to choke. You really want one throat to choke in these environments because somebody has to know what's going on to explain it to me. Otherwise, I need to come in and not believe anybody, right? So I, it's almost like when there's five people in the deal and nobody's representing the full financial stack, I almost want to talk to nobody and just build it from the bank statement. So that's a red flag. Um, Sellers withholding data or saying data isn't there that has to be there. I use the example of um seller has a tow truck company. Um, and you're like, hey, I need a fixed asset list, man, on all your trucks. Oh man, I don't 
I don't put fixed assets in my QuickBooks. I don't really have there's there's no list, man. Yeah. You gotta just yeah, you, you gotta do without it. And I'm like, so if I come on your lot and steal one of your trucks, nobody no. My foreman would know. He keeps track of every single truck in that lot. Well, guess who's got the list, Sean? The foreman's got the list, either on paper or he can write it. You know what I mean? Because if I cut the fence or or if I if I blow the fence and come in at night and take one, when he wakes up in the morning, he's going to know. So there's like when sellers hold back information that is material and it's pretty obvious that it's there, um, that becomes a red flag. I'm trying to think of some other ones. Recently, I've had sellers who only revealed um, like secondary systems that were pretty significant in their business after two or three weeks of questions about their numbers. So um, like a company may run a financial system like QuickBooks, but maybe they have some operating system, right? You know, people know Monday and other like project management software. So you might be asking all these questions about X and Y and Z and A and B and C. And then all of a sudden, three weeks in, somebody's like, well, all that's in Monday. Like, hold on, bro. So we've been looking at this for three weeks. And, I, and, and here's why, Sean, it might not be completely obvious. Sometimes these extra systems that get thrown into the mix were created by somebody who saw a due diligence provider coming in day one and they knew their stuff was wonky. So now they're going to go tell somebody to go create this system in Monday or whatever to back up their inflated story of profit and confuse someone who's not diligent enough to keep searching for the truth. That happened to me on a call today and three calls this week, like brand new systems. I'm a week from finishing my stuff. Wait, when you hear something like that, I mean, what's the knee jerk reaction? Just go back to them and go, listen, I have to start from scratch now, or? Sean, you'll appreciate this. Um, there are times when your job is probably pretty hard. When you projected $100 of revenue or profit and somebody comes in at 80, and it's just the way the business had, but now everybody wants to know, Sean, I want you to explain to me why this company didn't hit the number. I'll tell you what's rough for me. As a former deal professional that manages a team of accountants, there are times when I hear something out of a seller's mouth or a broker's mouth, and I'm like, based on my data set, and we're engineers, I'm 90% confident that this thing is wonky, right? But because my client, I, because I can't empirically describe my gut of you know 15 years on, on why I know that, what I end up having to do is interpret this new information, even though I know there's a high likelihood that it's been adjusted to tell the story that they wanted to tell and then point out ways and reasons why it's not reliable or not as reliable as other stuff. So I don't have to start over. What I have to do is now either find this new data useful, even though it came late, kind of get over that to work for my client or kind of show hey, man, here's three or four points where the financials in this system don't match. I could spend my whole time ingesting this whole new system, but if three points immediately don't match, probably other ones won't. We'd have to add on scope to ingest this. Let's stick to our process. And then I didn't get into this, but anyone, engineers, a lot of Silicon Valley people will understand system thinking. Um, our quality of earnings are systems. We know how to check the same number two or three times from different places. And we know the believability of numbers from taxes versus bank statements versus financial versus confidential information memorandums per cent. And so we understand this. But when we have to ingest other stuff, it's, it's wonky because, like, for instance, I know the bank won't uh, take a, a $5 bill on the 1st of January and call it. Uh, the previous year, because I call him like, hey, man, my guy couldn't get there until January 1. Can you put that $5 into 2022? No, nope, bank won't do it. Hey, IRS, uh, I know I gave you that one thing that, that I filed. Um, can I file uh, something brand new without uh, going through the process? I know how believable some of these things are. 
when you bring in this other stuff, it's just tough. But a lot of times my ability to cut through it differs from the clients and I have to work through that. Okay, with that, we got a couple minutes left. Can you tell us or share some stories, leaving out names, of course, of just things you've run across, things you've seen, just anywhere on so, the spectrum? Man, one of the craziest ones, I um, had a deal last year, e-commerce, um, higher ticket items like luxury goods and U.S. client, U.S. broker, um, Canadian company. Um, with a traditionally Canadian um, accountant. Um, they use IFRS, one system, we use a different system. They're actually not that different, but enough difference to kind of confuse people at the time. And the brokerage firm that was representing them, I knew had a penchant for doing wonky stuff to make companies look a lot better. They, they were good at putting lipstick on pigs. And I get into the first meeting, the kickoff meeting, and I find out that the Canadian CPA who'd been working with the company for 20 years um, was finishing up the taxes, but the brokerage firm had hired a third party unbiased CPA firm to redo the financials in U.S. Gap so that I wouldn't have to worry about those crazy Canadian IFRS financials. So now I've got a set of American Gap financials by a CPA firm that is calling themselves unbiased, but they work for the brokerage firm. They were brought in by this firm. Everybody knows where their bread is buttered. And then I'm also looking at a Canadian set of financials by a accounting firm that known the company for 20 years. Now, here's what makes it even more interesting. You and I both know that's weird. But if you get on a phone call with the broker, the seller who chose the broker, the seller who paid the Canadian due for 20 years, and the seller that authorized the broker to hire this other accounting firm, who's going to snitch? Nobody's telling. So everybody is answering questions, but covering stuff. They're speaking very slowly or they're over talking people because they know their arguments don't work. And then you're trying to figure out who on the call can you ask and you can't. You actually have to do the work and the numbers to show that the same business can't produce 110,000 of expense in the same line item at the same time, right? And what we ended up figuring out was that the, this won't be a surprise, the new CPA firm that was brought in by the brokerage firm had pushed the ad backs through the P&L ahead of the net income line so that they wouldn't fall under the net income line. So they wouldn't look like adjustments. They would just look like the business hadn't spent that money. I don't have long hair, but I, I almost pulled it out on that one. I was glad that I was. And what stunk is the client was so into the deal that it took like almost three hour long conversations to just explain there's no possible way that both of these accounts can be telling the truth at the same time or that both of them don't know exactly what's right and what's wrong, given their pedigree. You should walk away. Elliot, with that, how, if someone wants to find out more about you, what you're working on, what's the best way to go about doing that? Twitter's the best way. Um, I am King of QOE on Twitter or at Elliot E. Holland. If you get close, you'll find me. You can also come to my website, guardiandudiligence.com. And for those who want me to take a free look at your LOI, you can go to offer from Elliot and we will take a look at your letter of intent to kind of help you get prepared for what will hopefully be a quality earnings project down the line. Sounds fantastic. We're going to have all those links and information in the show notes. And for everyone out there, I mean, Elliot mentioned it when I'm not the host of the Silicon Valley podcast, I'm an investment banker focused on mergers, acquisition, growth capital. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always open for a conversation or to find out more about this show and future guests and what we're working on. Go to the Silicon Valley Podcast.com. Once again, that's the Silicon Valley Podcast.com. And with that, Elliot, I want to thank you once again for taking the time to be on this week's episode of the Silicon Valley Podcast. Thanks for having me.